Good evening, everyone. We are going to call the City of Deltona City Commission Workshop for Monday, July 12th, 2021 to order. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Vila Vasquez? Present. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner McCool? Here. Commissioner Ramos? Present. Commissioner Sosa? Here. Vice Mayor Bradford? Here. Mayor Herzberg? Here. And may we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Commissioner King, if you would like to lead us, thank you. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, as one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. So tonight we have one item on our workshop agenda, and it is a discussion regarding the public records process presented by the First Amendment Foundation Executive Director Pamela Marsh and First Amendment Foundation Staff Attorney Virginia Hamrick, and I believe they are via Zoom, live. Yes, we are here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Are you ready for us to begin? We are. Mr. Peters, did you have anything or would you like them to start? I think you can go ahead and start. Terrific. Thank you so much for having us this evening. I hope you all are well. Um, just a little bit about the First Amendment Foundation in case you're not familiar with us. We are a 501c3. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit, we receive no funds from any government source except through our memberships. And anyone can be a member. If you are entitled to receive public records and everyone in Florida is entitled to receive public records, then you can be a member of the First Amendment Foundation. We have citizens, other nonprofits, um, newspapers, media outlets such as broadcast, and local government agencies, boards, um, cities and county councils. Um, so we are very happy to have the city of Deltona as a member. Um, that's how we survive is by serving the public and um, being a resource, not an adversary as our mission says. Um, we believe in government openness and transparency. Those are our two main missions. Um, as our name suggests, we do um, assist with First Amendment and freedom of press issues. We generally don't get into the freedom of religion issues. Our main purpose is um, access to government records and government meetings. Um, and we try to help our memberships by informing them of the law and it changes so often. There's many exemptions added every year. So we try to stay on top of it so that we can help you stay on top of it. Um, so we do, we monitor the public records and open meetings laws. We hold training events like this um, and we believe that this promotes public participation. Um, the right to see and know what your government's doing is a good thing. Um, we believe you know that because your policy mission statement says openness leads to a better informed citizenry, which leads to a better government and better public policy. You couldn't have said it any better. Um, Thomas Jefferson said something very, very similar. He said, a well-informed electorate is a prerequisite to democracy. So open government leads to participatory government, and it allows us to find a medium, a median in the middle, a meeting of the minds, um, if we can know and understand what the issues are, we can all be governed better by those we choose to govern us. So tonight we're focusing solely on the public records law. We aren't going to focus on the sunshine law, which applies to open meetings, as I'm sure you all know. Um, the 
the access to public records is secured for Florida citizens in two ways. And that's really important. In 1992, the citizens of Florida voted to enshrine open government and specifically public records law in the Constitution of Florida. It is also in more detail articulated in Chapter 119 of Florida statutes. And I will tell you at this point, I'll stop and make a little plug for a book. It is um, written and um, edited by the Florida Attorney General's Office, and we, the First Amendment Foundation, have the honor of publishing it. I'm gonna try to show it on my screen. It's the Government in the Sunshine Manual. It comes out every year, and it is full of helpful information on both public records law and sunshine law, constitutional law, case law, the attorney general opinions on all of these issues. So if you can't find it in the sunshine manual, call us and we'll help you out. But um, it's, it's not a simple subject in Florida, um, although it is a firmly um, based subject in Florida. So we'll move on. This is the language of the constitutional right of access to records section. It's in Article 1, Section 24A. And as I mentioned earlier, it applies to every person. Every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record, and this language is important, made or received in connection with the official business of any public body, officer, or employee of the state, or persons acting on their behalf. We'll get into that a little bit more. This, sec this section specifically includes, oops, can you go back, Virginia? This section specifically includes the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government, counties, municipalities, and districts, and each constitutional officer, board, and commission. And just a little off topic, both the legislature and the judiciary have their own rules around public records, but we're focusing tonight on municipalities, boards, and agencies. Oh, and one more thing, just the fact that it is enshrined in the Constitution became very important just in the past year and a half while we've been in this pandemic. Um, other states who have public records laws but didn't have the language enshrined in the Constitution, some of them, Hawaii comes to mind, Virginia might be able to name some others, they just got rid of public records. They just said, we can't do it during the pandemic the public can't have your public records. But because our law is concrete, enshrined in our Constitution, that couldn't happen. And therefore, Florida's laws stayed fully in play even during the pandemic. So moving to the statute now, this is the Florida statutes, this big bunch of books that comes out every year. Um, in section 119.07, that's where you're going to find the Public Records Act. And it says, again, every person who has custody of a public record shall permit the record to be inspected and copied by any person desiring to do so at any reasonable time, under reasonable conditions, and under supervision by the custodian of the public records. This has changed a bit over time, not that it doesn't apply this way, but because there are so many exemptions now to the public records law, the custodian often has to go through the records prior to making them available for inspection. 
So because there are now almost 1,180 exemptions to the public records law, it's much more difficult. It's not just going in, asking for a file and going to the IBM copier in the lobby. Um, it's become much more complex. So that's the language of the law. And then there are pages and pages and pages of exemptions. And we'll talk some about that too tonight. So what is a public record? Um, pretty much everything you could think of that would be created or sent to a government office. So going through the list, documents, papers, letters, maps, books, tapes, photographs, films, sound recordings, data processing software, and other material. Because I think the legislature knew that time was going to march on and we were going to have texts and we were going to have um, selfies, um, instant messages, all sorts of things um, that could be requested. So they added to that a public record is anything regardless of the physical form, characteristics, or means of transmission made or received pursuant to law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business by any agency. So again, there's that critical language made or received pursuant to law or ordinance or more commonly, made or received in connection with the transaction of official business by any agency. And that is going to apply to municipalities and counties, as well as parts of the executive branch, which we refer to as agencies. Going on, this is just another definition that the Florida Supreme Court has given us of what a public record is. And in this case, Shevin versus Byron Hess et al., they said any material prepared in connection with official agency business, which is intended to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge of some type. And that'll take us to our next slide. When they said, perpetuate and communicate in that slide. The Supreme Court said, any material prepared in connection with official agency business intended to perpetuate or communicate, that's going to mean drafts prepared in connection with official business. Um, there is no unfinished business exemption. So if you've created a document to perpetuate a policy or communicate something to some other person in-house, that's still a public record, even if it's a draft. The distinction in that is if I'm a public employee and I'm sitting in a meeting and I make notes in my little legal pad and I never show them to anyone. They're only for me. I don't share them. I don't put them in some other form and then circulate them. I don't use them to make other documents. If I only take those notes just for me, maybe to remember the date of the next board meeting, and I don't show that to anybody, that is not a public record. But all other notes, if they get shared, circulated, used, you know, if you made notes and you put that in another memo, that very well could make those notes become a public record. And because the definition of public record is so broad and it covers so many things that are made in connection with official business, if a large number, if you request any and all records and any and all communications between city council members, 
it can produce an inquiry of thousands of records, um, possibly. And it can take, that takes time for the custodian to go through and review and redact. So while it's an, you can ask any and all to ensure that you're getting all records that you're seeking, if you make it specific to the time frame, um, all communication between March 1st and March 7th, for example, or ask for the specific type of record or invoice that you're seeking from the city and be specific and be precise, you can narrow down your request, narrow down the amount of records that would apply to that request, and that will help bring down any charges um, and that, that'll bring down the time it takes for the records custodian to review and produce those records and it brings down any fees. So being specific and knowing what you're asking for and being precise really helps. And that's because what is considered a public record is so broad. And in addition to what is considered a public record, paper records and electronic records are both subject to public disclosure. And Florida courts have said it applies to electronic records and records that only exist in digital form, just as it exists to paper records. And any information that's only, the record is only created on the computer, like an electronic calendar or a database, those, if, if the record is made in connection with official business, it is subject to disclosure. And there, again, there is no distinction between if it's a physical public record or an, ele an electronic public record. And it goes, the definition of public record is so important because this is how it's used to determine whether a public official or employee's email communications or text message communications are subject to disclosure. So email messages made or received in connection with official business um, are subject to disclosure unless there is a specific statutory exemption. And the Attorney General has also said that text messages are subject to the same rule. So if the text message is made or received in connection with official business, that is a public record. And it's also the same for social media. If an agency or a city employee uses their Facebook to conduct, um, to carry out public business, then that Facebook message could be a public record. And it's the same thing with Twitter direct messages or tweets. And if it, it's not all tweets, so a not all messages of a public official become public record, but if the tweet or the Facebook message is intended to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge in connection with official business, it is subject to disclosure. So always go back to that definition. And this also means, oh, let me get to the next slide. And so what the courts have said, if the email or the electronic communication was received in connection with official business, it is a public record and subject to disclosure. And what's important is the nature of the record, not the location. So even if it, the email is sent from a city email address or from a city official's cell phone, some city employees have cell phones, even if it's sent from that phone, it doesn't mean everything on it is public record. It has to be made in connection with official business. And it's the same way with, uh, if a official or an employee uses their cell phone for public, if they use their private cell phone for public business once, that doesn't open up their entire phone to, for public disclosure. It only opens, it only makes the records that were sent in connection with official business public. Um, that's a question I've had asked before if a officer or a public official uses their phone once, isn't all of that public? And no, only the messages and the emails and the direct messages on social media that are used, that are created in connection with the official business are subject to disclosure. 
and the retention of electronic records is set by the Department of State's Division of Library and Information Services. And it, again, it doesn't matter the form, it's the nature of the record. And the retention schedules apply regardless of the format that the record exists, um, whether it's physical, whether it's paper, or it's electronic. And there's no specific timeframes for electronic communications like emails, and text messages, it depends on the nature of the record and why it was created. Um, and it's generally these type of electronic communications, the retention schedule is generally the same for records and other formats that are that serve the same purpose or the same function. And text messages and Facebook messages may, that are used to communicate short-term value May only may be retained according to the transitory message requirements of the retention schedules, which just means not all official text messages are saved for as long as other text messages. It depends on the purpose and the function of those messages. And for the retention format, a agency does not have to maintain. Um, this is according to the Department of State's rules. They don't have to maintain the electronic file. They can maintain printouts of electronic communications as long as it includes the date that the message was sent and the timestamp and routing information. Um, and agencies are only required to maintain records in their native format if an agency is involved in or can reasonably anticipate litigation on a particular issue. So they can, for certain records, certain emails and text messages, maintain a paper format. No, I'm unmuted. Um, back to me. I do want to just very quickly emphasize two points that Virginia made. One is with respect to text messages and that they are considered public records and yet they're sent generally from telephones. There are archiving software packages or archiving apps and I highly encourage the use of them. Um, the other issue is, um, and I was a United States attorney uh, before I took this job, and so I worked for the Department of Justice and it was very important and absolutely forbidden to do official business on your personal cell phone. If someone contacted me in my official capacity on my cell phone, I was to copy my DOJ address and forward that to the DOJ address before I ever responded. And then in that email, make clear that the person writing to me about business should only correspond with me at the DOJ address. I think that's a very, very good practice. And I saw it in your excellent policy that you already have, that if you receive business text to your personal phone or you receive business emails to your personal email account, forward those, archive them, take a, a screenshot, make some record of that because it is truly a public record and it should not be destroyed. That would be a violation. So who's responsible? Um, in the city of Deltona, as I'm sure you all know, the city clerk's office is designated the records custodian. Um, so you have a team of people ready to respond. Um, the language in the statute is mandatory. Every person who has the custody of a public record shall permit the record to be inspected and copied by any person. So it's shall permit inspection. It does give discretion as to time, place, and conditions 
um, and allows for the supervision of the custodian of the record. Um, we have a template on our website of what I think is a very good request for a public record. Um, it can be sent by email, it can be sent by snail mail, but we just have a template with some good language um, that I think is a very good place for a citizen to start. It, um, it tells the person receiving the public records request that if the request is denied, they'd like to know why the request was denied, because that's part of the requirements as well. There has to be a justification. Um, and we always tell people who call in or write in and people we train, we, we tell them, try to use a scalpel when you draft your public record so that you get exactly and precisely the documents you want. Um, don't use a, a sledgehammer and get hundreds and hundreds of documents that it's gonna be a burden on you to go through once you receive them and it's gonna be a burden on the custodian. So really use a scalpel and we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. So contractors, um, this public records law extends the law that applies to agencies, municipalities, counties, to all contractors that are hired by the government. So if you want a copy of the contract and, and you do a public records request for that contract, you're going to see in it that that contractor promises to comply with the public records law. So all of the public records law is extended to entities who are delegated governmental tasks, decisions, et cetera. Um, but I'll caution you there. I keep talking about exemptions and saying we're going to get to them. Um, there are many exemptions around this area, um, particularly in the area of trade secrets. Um, so many contractors who are doing a particular service for the government may have a particular way of doing it or information that's their, their um, secret sauce. And that may be actually protected by an exemption um, in the public records law. But for the most part, I think it's important to know that if you're delegating uh, a task or a decision to someone else, the public records law is going to apply to them too. It's not a way of evading the public records law. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but I just want you to know how broadly we mean it when lo the law says any person can request a public record. Um, the, the very first part of the law, section 119.01 sub 1 says, it's the policy of this state that all state, county, and municipal records are open and for inspection and copying by any person. And then that word person is really broadly defined to include not just individuals, but firms, associations, joint ventures, partnerships, estates, trusts, corporations, and all other groups or combinations. So they, they get into that, you know, loosey goosey last term to include things that maybe we don't foresee at this time. A public employee is a person who can request public records. And even a government agency can request public records from another agency. So um, really and truly anybody can get records from the government. It's just a matter of whether those exemptions are gonna apply. The the public records law is subject to 
or records requests are subject to reasonable conditions and absent any statutory specific statutory authority, an agency cannot require requests be made in writing a requester to disclose their name or address or phone number or provide a reason for the request. And there are exceptions to this, and that's the absent specific statutory authority, certain crash reports, certain records. Uh, there is grounds you have to provide your name and or your address, or there, there are reasons for requiring those names. And so there are exceptions to that general rule. And I would also note that um, a court has ruled that a government entity is not required to provide public records to a generic email request, um, at least not until such time that it's clear that the address belongs to a person and it's not a phishing expedition. Um, in, the, in that specific case, the request came from askforrecords at gmail.com and said they were on behalf of a corporation. The corporation was not named. There was no way for no other email address or phone number or address listed for the custodian to respond. And the custodian thought it was a phishing expedition and they thought it was spam. And then they, the agency was sued and the court said the, the custodian could wait and verify whether the email was legitimate and whether the requester was legitimate um, before providing the request. That was not an unreasonable delay. And on the delay, there are two requirements of the public records law, a prompt response and a reasonable production. So with the prompt response, an agency must promptly respond and in good faith. There's no time frame for a prompt response, um, nor is there any time frame for, re for the reasonable production of records. Um, courts have said that it reasonable means the time it takes to locate a record, to review it for exempt information, and provide a copy of the, re of the request to the requester. An unjustified delay can be a violation of the public records law. And even if an agency promptly responds and resp acknowledges that the request has been made, if they still do not have a justification for providing that record, they can be liable. And again, as I just mentioned, um, a delay in responding to an email request from an email with no identification and no way for the custodian to contact the requester and verify that it was legitimate, that is considered a reasonable delay. So there can be time to confirm the validity of the requester and make sure this isn't going to hack the agency's computer. And more on the reasonable production, just reiterating this, a records custodian may delay the production um, only to determine whether the record exists, if the custodian believes that some or all of the record is exempt, if the requesting party fails to pay the appropriate fee and to physically retrieve the record and remove and redact any exempt or confidential information. And just again, the time spent reviewing and redacting the records for um, any F exempt information, it has been considered reasonable. And time spent clarifying a request can be considered reasonable. If, if the custodian has to take time to determine what the requester is asking, I think that would come under determining whether this record exists. Um, and that again goes back to making your request precise. And like Pam said, using a scalpel and making specific requests that are narrow so the custodian doesn't have to spend time figuring out what records you're seeking. And, and back to electronic records, an agency has to provide public records in some meaningful form. The agency 
must provide a record in the form that it exists. And if the record is not maintained in that specific format, if you're asking for an email in a specific format, but it can only be provided this way, an agency is not required to convert the record into a different electronic format. They have an option to do that, but they can charge for any extensive labor that it took, any extra time that it took to produce that new document. So if you do request the record in a specific format and it's not maintained that way, then you can be charged for the time spent changing the document. And again, an agency is not required to provide records in electronic format other than the standard routinely maintained by the agency. So they don't have to go beyond how they typically keep records. Yeah. Back to Pam for fees and costs. And I always forget to unmute. Yeah. <laughs> the sign of our times. Um, I do want to just go back to um, who can request a document just very briefly. Um, it's absolutely irrelevant what the person's motive is seeking the record. Um, that was decided by the third DCA. Um, and even though a public agency may um, truly believe that a requester is doing this for no good purpose, is annoying and, and making public records requests for the purpose of harassment, um, the public records are available to all. And the fact that a person seeking access to records wishes to use, use them to sell them some commercial purpose, make money off of that, um, that also does not alter his or her rights under the public records law. Um, but I do want to point out that according to a fourth DCA case, um, a case is called Lozman, um, it's worth noting that if a requester asks for records and then the agency pulls them all together and the requester says, oh, now I don't really want them. I don't want, I don't want them and I don't want to pay for them. Um, then the next time that the requester asks for records, the custodian has the discretion to refuse to provide the second batch of records until the requester pays for the first batch of records. There is that discretion. Um, and there's also an attorney general's opinion on this that I wanted to reference. Um, in that case, they, um, and this is allowed, the custodian may request a deposit for records that are being pulled together, reviewed and redacted. So they can come up with an estimate and ask for a deposit. And what happened in this AGO question to the attorney general was that the custodian asked for a deposit, but it was maybe a percentage, let's say 50% of what the actual cost was going to be. And when all of the work was done and all of the um, information was gathered, then the requesting party said, nope, I don't want them, forget about it. And instead of the requester getting his deposit back, it was the other way around. The attorney general said the custodian could bill the difference between the deposit and the actual cost, that even though the requester said he didn't want the records anymore, the city or county in this, in this question had already done all the work and he had intended you know, he had suggested his intent to get the records. And so that requester owed the balance between the actual cost and the deposit that had already been paid. 
So I, I thought those were two things that were important to bring up um, before we get into fees and costs. So um, our image up here kind of looks like um, a requester for public documents is going to run into a big tidal wave of cost and fees. Um, and yet here you see the general fee provision in the Public Records Act allows a charge of no more than 15 cents a page for paper copies up to legal size, plus an additional five cents for two-sided copies or the actual cost of duplication for large size papers, maps, architectural drawings, et cetera, or non-paper copies that you might be saving onto a disc um, or a thumb drive. So I, you know, th those costs don't look so gargantuan. I think they're probably, you know, in line, maybe a few cents more than Kinko's. Um, and labor and overhead costs for actually making the copies are specifically excluded. Those costs cannot be passed on to the requester. But there is this thing called extensive use. So it's not just the general fee provision, we have the extensive use provision. Um, an agency may charge a reasonable fee for extensive use of agency resources, both information technology or personnel, in addition to the actual cost of duplication. So the fees have to be reasonable. And now the law has changed relatively recently. Now it has to be based on actual costs incurred. Um, so the Department of Corrections ha had a case that they brought um, and they were asking whether the 15 cent, or sorry, whether it was reasonable to start charging the extensive use fee after 15 minutes when they were copying prison records. And the court said, the agency has discretion. We're not going to overrule the agency's discretion to decide when their extensive use fee kicks in. Um, so this is again why citizens must really draft your public records request precisely, narrowly, you can limit your request to a certain date range. That's a really good way to shorten um, the number of documents or, or lower the number of documents. You could limit the documents to those that include a certain person's name um, that might that might likely be on the document or included in the communications. That's another really good way to shorten the number of documents you might be receiving. Um, and you, you, know, you can think through other terms of art um, that might be used if you're seeking records on a certain issue or a certain project or a certain um, decision that was made by a board or a county. So there's lots of ways that um, you can think about your issue and, and what it really is that you're trying, you have an interest in, you're, you really want to understand. And if it happened, you know, like the pandemic from March 12th or 13th through, you know, pick a day, um, then that may be the, the, the perfect time frame to put in something rather than just give me all the documents that retain that that use the word pandemic because that could pull up scientific documents from years prior. Um, so I think that's all I have to say on that slide. So. You don't have to use extensive use. It's not required, 
um, you don't have to have an extra fee that you're going to add on if you redact and if you, you know, have a staff that's going to go through and make sure something's not exempted under the Florida statutes. But agencies, if you're going to use it, you should have a definition of what that means. And Deltona, I already saw it. You have a good definition of extensive use. Good job. You followed the Sunshine Manual well. Um, and be prepared to give a justification for the definition and for when you're going to use it. Um, Special service charges should be implemented in a manner that reflects the purpose int and intent of the public records law and doesn't unreasonably infringe on the right of access. And I'm gonna add to this slide that the public records law was never ever intended to be a profit making mechanism for government agencies. That's why they limit it to actual cost. Um, so I would say the same thing about extensive use. If you're going to use it, um, make sure that you're not going to have a profit at the end of the day. It should be only what you had to do in order to produce these records in accordance with the law. I will tell you, we've seen some astronomical ones lately. Um, not from Deltona, um, but we saw a $42,000 extensive use fee. That's $42,000, like the price of a car, um, charged to a nonprofit that was requesting a pretty small set of emails. We saw $10,000 charged to a large newspaper. Um, those were health records that were being sought. And more recently, we saw $43,000 in extensive use fees charged to a media coalition, um, a coalition of journalists. So my guess is that they probably know how um, to push back on that and ask for that justification, that reasoning of how in the world do you get to $43,000 in extensive use fees? Um, but I will say in working with the nonprofit that had the $42,000 extensive use charge, we were able to work with them, narrow their search, put in some good search terms and bring that price tag down to less than $2,000. So don't feel like if you get a big price tag that you can't work with the person on the other side to try to get to, you know, yes and yes. It doesn't have to be yes and no. You can get both parties to yes. It's just a matter of communicating. So there is a presumption of openness. All records are presumed open and subject to disclosure unless there's that specific statutory exemption. And only the legislature can create exemptions. The courts cannot do that. They are not to make those laws. However, it seems to me as executive director of the First Amendment Foundation, that the legislature really likes every session, they really like to create new exemptions. Um, I may have already mentioned this already, but we're over 1,170 exemptions, almost 1,180 exemptions to Florida's open government laws. Um, that's one of the things we as a foundation try to fight. We dislike almost all exemptions because not only does it deny public access, it also places an enormous burden on the government custodians to have to redact, to have to go through and think of those 1,180 exemptions that might apply under certain circumstances, um, it makes the work really hard. Um, 
going on to the next slide, if the custodian decides an exemption applies, she needs to know which statute applies and be able to explain that with particularity um, and explain why it applies. So this case, Krischer versus D'Amato, said the public records law is to be liberally construed in favor of open government and exemptions from disclosure are to be narrowly construed. So they are limited to their stated purpose. So there's an enormous balancing act that's gonna have to go on and the weight is on the side of disclosure. The weight is on the side of of open government and the exemptions should be very narrowly construed. Um, so again, a presumption of openness. And if an agency denies a request for a public record, the agency must put the denial in writing, provide the exact statutory citation to that exemption that authorizes the denial, and be able to explain with particularity the conclusion that the record is exempt if asked to do so by the requester. And so to the public, I would say, remember, if you get a denial and it doesn't state the reason, it doesn't give you a statutory exemption and it doesn't explain why the statutory exemption applies, you should ask. You know, it, it's, it's your right to know. You don't have to get pushy about it, but if you want to understand the public records law and maybe how to write a better public record that might avoid those exemptions, it's always worth asking. So this is one of my favorite images of the redactions. Um, if a record does contain exempt and non-exempt information, the custodian shouldn't say, well, there's exempt information in this, we're just not going to give it to you. The custodian and his or her office should redact only the part, narrowly construing the part that is exempt and provide the remainder. And an extensive use fee may be imposed if this redaction and review process requires an extensive use of agency resources. With the presumption of openness, there is nothing in the public records law that gives private citizens a right to recover from an agency for negligently maintaining and providing information from public records. And how this connects with the presumption of openness, if a record is exempt, that just means it's not subject to the mandatory disclosure requirements. An agency can release it, but they're not required to. However, if, it, if a record is confidential, then, then a custodian is prohibited from releasing the information. So if, an, if a record is merely exempt, um, it's, there's no personal, a, a private citizen does not have a right of action and cannot bring an action for releasing that information. However, a custodian is not protected against intentionally communicating public records to someone outside of an agency unless the person inspecting the record has made a good faith request to inspect the records, so they, they've sent a request to the agency, or the communication is necessary to the agency's transaction of business and passing it along to another agency um, is necessary. And an agency is not liable if they release a record that the information is outdated and that, in, that outdated information is later used for insurance purposes, a city cannot be found liable for that. In one instance where a someone did bring 
a cause a, a lawsuit against a city for releasing video. This was a very um, egregious example, and a police department showed a hour long autopsy of a 14 year old, showed a, a video of the autopsy of a minor to someone who worked at the agency and never requested the records. And this was reported in a newspaper. And a court said that was in intentionally releasing protected information. However, that case was uh, eventually the city was not liable um, under qualified immunity. So getting a little into the weeds, but I just bring that, I, I raise that point to show there are limited instances of lawsuits against custodians for releasing um, and disclosing any exempt or confidential information. And with the 1100 exemptions, some statutes have different language about liability and releasing the information. For example, in section 119071, which is a section with many public records exemptions for safety and security exemptions, that's the home address exemptions. There is an exemption for um, video depicting a killing of a mass murder or killing of a law enforcement officer during official conduct. And if a custodian willfully or knowingly um, discloses that exempt information, they, that custodian can be liable. Um, there are other statutes that deal with disclosure and have similar language, but it goes to the specific statute of what the liability is. And, but for the most part, generally custodians are only liable for intentional releases of confidential information. And to just define knowingly and willful, um, the Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court has defined that as conscious, well-informed, deliberate, um, not accidental or involuntary. So this is a voluntary release of confidential and protected information. And with, if there are violations of the public records law, it can result in non-criminal fines for unintentional violations, and the fine can be up to $500. And for intentional violations of the public records law, that can be a first degree misdemeanor, and which can be punishable by not more than $1,000, or one year in jail. And public officers who intentionally violate the Public Records Act can be suspended or removed um, from their position. And getting, I kind of went into that quickly, but a public records violation is wrongfully withholding the records, not releasing records that are subject to disclosure. And as I've mentioned, unreasonable and unjustified delay can be a violation of the Public Records Act. And if a party brings a lawsuit, so if there is civil liability, a court must award um, the plaintiff or the person bringing the lawsuit a reasonable, the reasonable cost of enforcing that. And the, so the plaintiff will get attorney's fees if the court determines that the agency unlawfully refused to allow the record to be inspected or copied and the requester provided notice of the request to the custodian at least five days before bringing the lawsuit. However, if the requester who, if the person who made the public records request and then brought the lawsuit is found to have an improper purpose, that requester would be liable for the agency's attorney's fees. So if someone brings a frivolous lawsuit and a, a court finds that the lawsuit is frivolous, then that party is responsible for paying the government's attorney's fees for defending that lawsuit. And so there is a fee shifting provision. It is mandatory if the requester is found to have been, if it's found that the request was, the agency unlawfully refused to release the records and there was proper notice, 
of the request. However, it shifts and the plaintiff is required to pay the attorney's fees if a court um, finds that the lawsuit was frivolous. And we are open for questions now. Pam, do you have anything to add on that or? I just want to let people know um, that this is our telephone number, um, our hotline, info at floridafaf.org. You can send us, uh, email us questions. Um, I'm really proud of how promptly we tend to respond. We have a bevy of young law students willing to help us from time to time. Um, and we also do sell the sunshine manual. So if you'd ever like to have, like I do, your own manual in your car, in your home, in your office, um, cause you never know when you're gonna get a sunshine question or an open government question, um, just go to our website. It's at www.florida, spelled out, F-A-F, Org, so Florida First Amendment Foundation.org, um, and you can buy them there. But other than that, we'll open up the floor for your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioners, do you have um, questions? Just go ahead and, Commissioner Sosa. Yeah, I'd like to go back to um, who's responsible when we're going to cus uh, the custodian of public records. Uh, when we have third parties, let's say like solid waste, and we have a residence that's requesting, you know, information regarding our third party. Who is responsible for providing those records? Would the city be responsible or would our contractor be responsible for doing that? I'm gonna say both. Um, optimally, it would be great if the contractor would just hand them over. Um, they do sign on, like I said, um, to comply with the public records laws when they're delegated governmental tasks. Um, but if they don't, then it is the government's responsibility to go to the contractor and say, hand them over. Okay, thank you. Um, an another one I get asked a lot by different people is if, say city vehicles are equipped with GPS and they want, say, specific GPS trackings for certain vehicles at certain times of the day or certain areas, say a certain street, if they came up and down that street. Um, is that exempt from public records, that information? Um, a, I think it would likely be exempt. I'll let Virginia... Um, chime in on this one as well, under the security and safety exemptions that are in the Florida statutes. Um, I would add um, that just as a prosecutor, um, I know that it's it requires a court order to put a GPS tracker on a vehicle. So I, I don't think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about city vehicles that just have GPS trackers on them Correct. as a matter yes. of course. Correct, like city vehicles buses, that have trackers, yes. Yeah, um, that would be a specific exemption. Virginia, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if you have more to add. You're mute. No, I I would need to look. I think it could come under the fire safety and security. It also depends from my understanding of some agencies in the GPS recording, not all of it saves and becomes a record and becomes permanent. Some, some of the information is written over depending on the GPS system from different custodians. I've, spoken with, so it depends on how the information is maintained, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. Um, and just one last thing, uh, for custodians of public records, anybody who has that document is the custodian. So say, um, I'll use one of our facilities called the center. If a resident came in and wanted to inspect, let's say an event that they had that weekend, then they wanna look at the financials for that event. Um, that 
if, if the records are held at that facility, does the individual have the right to inspect them there if somebody's present to provide them? Or do they have to wait for it to go to the clerk's office to be able to view those documents? I'm gonna look at your own policy and see um, what that says. I think it would, would likely be in the procedure um, of how those are handled. So in your hypothetical, there's an event at, give me your hypothetical again, please. Okay, we have this facility, it's called a center. It's kind of like a little mini convention center. And sometimes people like to see what the cost is for an event, if it made money, if it's losing money. And if they want to go to that facility that has the records and they show up at the facility and somebody's there, they would be the custodian of the record, correct? And would they have to provide that record? I mean, it, 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 there should be nothing confidential on it. There's no social security numbers, anything like that. It would just be numbers, X event uh, cost $300 to put on. We had 300 people show up, we made a profit or we made a loss. Would those types of records need to be gone through with the clerk or will the custodian that's at that facility be able to handle that? So this is just my opinion, um, but in your policy, it does say the city clerk is charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the city's public record program meets the mandates of the Public Records Act. And in order to do that, your clerk's office needs to um, make a record of who or what records were viewed. Um, they wanna make sure that they don't lose their originals. Um, so my guess is that there is a process that's probably pretty effective that gets those documents to your clerk and then your clerk can properly process them. Because one of the other parts of the public records law and procedures that are recommended for each city to develop um, is that once you email me in writing that you want a record, you get a response very quickly that gives you a confirmation number that we've received this, you're in line, we're working on it, we'll get you an estimate. There's a whole process that it goes through. I, the, the thing that gives me a little pause is whether the person who's at your event center would have the final tallies, would be able to process the record request as same as the clerk would process it, or are we going to create a situation where there's no consistency in the disclosure of records, and that's critically important, I would, I believe, as a lawyer, that you're going to treat every person the same who asked you for a public record. Okay, what, what about if there was a difference and it was an inspection as opposed to a public records request? Would that make a difference? What kind of inspection? Just you wanna do a records inspection, just to look at the, just, just to look at the, uh, you know, let's say that file for that event. Well, and so that's another thing, and I mentioned this at the beginning, the way governments now respond to public records requests has become complicated by the exemptions. Um, it used to be, I think, when this law was initially drafted that, and there weren't so many exemptions, that clerks could go to their back file cabinet bring out a load of files and say to the requester, here's, here's the files, I'm gonna be standing right here, you go through them, put a sticky note on all the ones you think you want to make copies of, and we'll copy those for you afterwards. 
right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what the language sounds like. Every person can inspect and copy. Um, but because of all the exemptions now, before that inspection and copying can even begin, somebody's going to have to go through and make sure, oh gosh, our, our um, state prosecutor's name is in there and his address. And our, um, uh, let's see, let's say it was an inspection of ambulance services. Um, Emergency doctors and emergency technicians, their names and addresses, I believe, are exempt. So there would still have to be a time in which some expert, some custodian that knows what he or she's doing is going to go through and make sure the proper redactions are made before that inspection and copying can take place. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank you. And, Virginia, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would just add, we have 119071A up, the next portion, Part B. It does say that the custodian of public records, uh, a person having custody, may designate an, another officer or employee of the agency to permit inspection and copying of the public records. But the identity of that designated person um, must be disclosed and made known. So cities can, and agencies can designate someone as the person in charge, even if they don't necessarily have physical custody right then and there of the record, but they're in charge for answering the request. And I've noticed that your city does have an office uh, for the clerks, um, you know, and she has a deputy. And so it's not just a, a one person shop. Um, you've got uh, four people, I think your website said, who are doing this work. Um, so that's a good thing. I think you're ahead of the curve. Commissioner, are you good? Okay, Commissioner McCool. Yes, um, I, I am a resident. Um, I am an elected official. I'm a business person. So the, my interest in these things are, um, you know, multi-platform. And I want to know who or what makes the determination about what is proprietary information because when someone is asking to inspect my records, right, I'm, I believe in First Amendment, I believe in openness of government, I believe in everything that we're talking about. But when someone is talking about inspecting my records as far as it goes to proprietary information such as profit margins, such as labor cost, as it doesn't relate to what my contract is, I want to know who makes that determination about what is proprietary. It may be the court. If you want to get um, a decision on that, it may be the court. Um, but keep in mind, um, we just had passed a um, anti-declaratory action law um, passed by the legislature, signed by the governor. Um, so the way I think this would work, now that we have this law in effect, is that the requester would ask for the record. The custodian would narrowly construe the exemption, although I will tell you, there must be, what, 20-something trade secret exemptions that are in different parts of different statutes. Um, many of them were up for uh, renewal this year. That's why we were so um, surprised that there, was, there were so many. Um, so that would be narrowly construed. It would be redacted if the custodian believed it fell within the trade secret exemption. It would be disclosed if the custodian thought it did not fall within the redaction. And then if you, as the contractor, believed that something was about to be disclosed improperly, um, I, I think in light of the anti-declaratory action, 
you as Joe Citizen, not you as your commissioner role, but, but you as a resident, I think would bring a lawsuit to say, I believe this needs to be redacted before it's released. Or if it were redacted and given to the citizen and they didn't like the redaction, then they could bring it to court and say, I don't believe the trade secret exemption should have been interpreted this broadly, and I think I deserve to know what was in here. So there would be a process, but I think it would be a legal process in the court to interpret the trade secret law. Okay, my next question. And there are, Go ahead, I was sorry. just gonna add, for each, now there will be in October, when it becomes law, it has been signed, but there's a specific definition for trade secrets and any proprietary business information held by a city. So if it meets that definition, then it is not subject to the public records disclosure and it is confidential. So an agency, a city cannot release that information. So if it meets that definition and now it's there's no burden on the person filing it, but some state agencies do have requirements about the person submitting the, the trade secret information has to remove it. So it, it depends on where you're submitting, where the information is going and who, who is receiving the information. Right, I think that's an, a really important point is you know, if you, as a business owner, were seeking a contract from the city and you felt some of your proprietary information was in there, then I think the burden would be on you to ask that that information be withheld under the new trade secret definition. Isn't that right, Virginia? Mm -hmm. Okay. The city can also withhold it, though. It's okay. not only on the... Um, contractor. Last question I would like to ask, what is the legal definition or what do we call frivol frivolous or improper? Because I'm pretty sure that's broad interpretation, but I would like to understand that myself. The laws for improper purpose, and it's defined as this is a new a relatively new statute that was recently enacted and it hasn't been given much interpretation from the courts, but it is defined as a request made primarily to cause a violation of the public records law and frivolous is not defined. So it's the improper purpose that was defined. I may have been saying frivolous and I apologize, but it's for brought for an improper purpose. Good. Okay. Vice Mayor Bradford. All right. I'm just going to throw the elephant out there. So every city, I think, has these individuals that are doing, like you're saying, where they're giving nonstop records request just, and then they get the fee, and then they get the bill, and then they don't do it, and then they do another one, and it's just to inundate the clerk's office. So you were stating... You know, and I am I allowed to give specifics, Mr. Peters, like Braille? Okay. So let's hypothetically say somebody requests records and they want them in Braille and they want it this way. Are we required, if we don't generally have them, to provide a records request to somebody in Braille just because they requested it? Not that they needed it, but because they requested it. I think that's a situation where because it's going to cost you to convert your record to Braille, that you could ask for, at the very least, a deposit um, prior to having the document converted to Braille. And then, like the Attorney General's opinion I described, if after the document is finalized and ready to be produced to the requester, the requester then says, I don't want it. I don't want it anymore. Not only do you not have to refund his deposit, but 
he has to pay the full cost that you've told him was, you know, I imagine that the company who's creating the Braille documents can give you a pretty good estimate of what it's gonna cost to get there. Um, and then you could ask for a deposit, that's absolutely legal. And the attorney general's opinion said if they refuse to pay after they've given the deposit and said they want it, if they change their mind, they're still on the hook for the full cost. Yeah, okay. Because there's there's been many that individuals have been doing the request after request after request, and I don't know if we've been doing that or not, where we're like, no, we're not doing any more of these requests at this point, but I don't want to say it's a waste of time, but it's it's just flat out a waste of time. It's a waste of the clerk's time, it's a waste of the other staff's time and commission's time, you know, and it's just, so what, what they throw at us is, is we're in violation of ADA regulations as well because we're not producing that record in Braille, even though we know that person's not blind and is well capable of reading and seeing it. Um, so does that, does that trep anything under ADA at all, or that's just straight out, I'm just trying to be, I don't want to say there difficult, but it's just straight up difficult. Yeah, there have been numerous lawsuits against cities and counties, not with the same fact pattern you're describing, but accusing the county or municipality of not having um, internet records, website records that are um, site impaired legible. And um, it was a string of, you know, threatening letters from lawyers and then lawsuits and some high dollar awards. But I will tell you in the end, one of those attorneys was sanctioned. Um, so it's not, it's not an easy question. Um, I empathize and sympathize with the problem. Um, but, you know, there's also case law that says prisoners have to pay for records just like everybody else. Um, that, you know, they're just like every other citizen too and they don't have to get their records for free. So there is an established precedent that everyone should be treated the same. And it is the actual cost of providing the record that is allowed. So I'm just one lawyer. People can certainly disagree with me, but that's my opinion. Thank you very much. So, so if, if I can jump in really quick, just to piggyback on that. Um, so for example, a person makes a request and pays the deposit, say 50%, and then says, okay, you know, you're ready, you got the record ready to produce, and they say, and they, they came in and they paid cash for it. Let's say they paid $25 or $50, right, in cash. And um, then you go ahead and say, okay, we've produced the record, and now you owe us the, the, the next 50%, $50. And they say, no, I don't want it. So per public records law, you're not allowed to ask a name. They can file that anonymously. They don't have to provide an address, a telephone number, or anything else. So how do you go about then collecting that? You can keep your deposit, but you have no way to redeem that money because you're not allowed to ask anything. Am I correct? Yes, you're presenting a very difficult fact pattern. I'm not sure I would pass this exam. Um, I, I just, I mean, that, that's just the other side of, of that because it's easy to say they can yeah. pay that other half. But if you, saying, you have- How did they pay the first half? They just came in and they paid the $50, didn't give a name, paid in cash, nothing or, identified or a student, the person. Uh, you know, John Doe, yeah. here's, here's, my, yeah. here's my $50, I'll come back and pay, and pay the rest. And then they, and they, they you know. Yeah. No, I've seen that's some agencies who only take check or card, and they like. I've seen an agency. I've recently was made aware of an agency that only accepts checks or debit for cards. They don't take cash. Is that for legal? Requests. I 
I don't know if that's why. I don't know. I need to look at the law for that, and that may that may explain why. But I don't. I'm not giving saying do that. But I'm just saying there are some agencies who are limiting how they accept payment. Uh, Very honestly, this is something that I'd like to come back to you with. Yeah. Um, yes. We do have legal interns to to do some research for us, and you know, if if you're going to um, impose an extensive use fee, and we know that's allowed, and if you're going to require somebody to give a deposit of half, then it seems to me that it's only logical that you have to have some way to be able to reach out to them to say, your records are ready, come pay me the other half. Um, so maybe, maybe this is an attorney general question um, that we that we send and say, if it's you know the law says you don't have to identify yourself, um, and yet we get these fees, we ask for deposits, all of that's allowed, but in the end we can't close the deal. Um, so I would really like to get back to you on that. I think we can, um, Virginia and I are both going to a conference at the end of this week, but um, maybe early next week we can get an opinion to you. Okay, that would be, that'd be great. Can I add, yeah, can I add sure. to that as well? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and then I'm gonna go, yeah. um, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Abel of Vasquez and I'll just okay. close, I have a couple questions. Yeah, so, go ahead, so, Vice I, Yeah, so that was gonna be the next part was as well. Then, so say you also had in here where if, if the clerk is not able to identify like the email, the person, whether it's phishing or spam. So if you have individuals who are constantly changing their email addresses and their names, so they've requested it, you know, like the mayor saying, we, they've requested it on this, but they didn't get it. And now they're sending another request under this and another request under this name. And they're just generating request after request after request, but they're using all these made up new emails each time. You're saying from what I interpreted and help me understand that, that they can identify and say, this is the same individual or we have to have time to research that this is the same person that's been doing all these other records requests and group that under like, hey, you know, you've requested this five times over here and you don't follow through on it and we've identified you're the same person doing this request but under this name over here, are they still able to say, listen, you're, you're hitting that extensive mark or what proof do they have to have that it is that same individual? And I'm sure staff's probably already talked to you guys about this, but I'm just curious myself because I we get the emails as well. Gosh. So does that make sense? So they'll do a records request, they put it in just to get staff going on it, then they'll put in another, under the same, another person's another name, and then another name, another name. It's like they're just beating the system. So here's my suggestion. This is what um, a lot of the executive agencies do. They don't even start working on pulling the records until they've given the requester an estimate. And it may be that when you send the requester this estimate that they immediately say, we don't want it anymore. But I, I would highly recommend, I think, <laughs> that you have a way, and I think it's already in your policy, of estimating the number of records, how long it may take to redact and review, um, and then send them the estimate and ask them to pay half up front. Um, and it may be at that point, they say, no thanks, I don't want them, or they go away. No, they just keep coming back with a different name. Yeah, don't pull the records. <laughs> don't pull, I, 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 here I am speaking about, you know, open government, but I would say don't have your poor staff pulling the records until you know that the costs are gonna be covered. Virginia, am I wrong? Well, the public records law does allow an advanced deposit of the entire bill. 
So not, it, from my understanding, you can just require the entire deposit, like you were saying, the executive agencies do. They require all of the estimated costs up front rather than the, just a portion. And then if it is, if there's a difference, it may be refunded. Well, but can so they identify? That is, so that's correct. But can they identify, if they're saying, look, this is this, we, we've already given this total and now you're giving me another one. And like you were saying, I don't know how to explain it because I guess it's crazy and nobody even believe this is happening, but they, they answer their records request and then another records request come in and like you're saying, it's okay, this is excessive. I'm now not gonna give you this request until you pay blah, blah, blah. Once they identify that this, this email, this email, this email, this email, this email and all the 20 others or 100 others um, are the same person, can then they say now you're going to pay us for all these 100 requests that we've previously done or not? Once it, or, is it possible? I mean, because we're seeing if, if this person requests it, they don't do it, we're now able to charge them back for that. So if these other emails that are coming in are being identified that it is the same person making this request, can we say, listen, you're now responsible to pay these just because you use another name, which is false, or no? So my gut instinct, and that is all it is, is my gut instinct, is that because of the law's emphasis on anonymity, that you should um, you should uh, go slowly <laughs> when trying to identify a record requester who's trying to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to think you should treat them one by one. And you know, receive the email, do the automatic bounce back. We've received your request. We'll get an estimate to you soon. Send an estimate, perhaps for the full cost, as Virginia was stating. And if they don't pay it, they don't get it. And then if that same email address asks for a second one, it's the same identical email address, then you can say, you have discretion to say, I am not going to pull any records for you until you pay for the prior records request. Now, what I think you're saying is that the same person is using five different email addresses. And that's when I would caution against trying to connect all those dots and identify someone because they do have the right to remain anonymous. But that's, again, just my gut instinct. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Avila Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to go back to um, one of the questions and answers uh, that was posed in the beginning. So we have a procedure in place. We have our city clerk who is the custodian for public records requests. She has a second person assigned for her backup. Right? That's the procedure. So am I understanding correctly when you said that if a person appears at the center, which was used as the example, and says, I would like to see this invoice or this document, just to view it, I don't want a copy of it, I just want to look at it, is that allowed? Because we have a procedure. We have um, someone who is in charge of it, she has a backup, and following this procedure, keeps a track record of these requests. And that is the reason why we have a procedure. So going around the procedure, um, and something comes up with someone requesting just to view something, that person at the center or whatever department it is, is not gonna keep a document of that request, unless, I'm not sure if we have a policy that says, 
you have to fill out a, a form first. I don't know if we have that. So if we don't have that, that request is lost between the cracks. We have no record other than somebody's word. Um, so I am just want to clarify, can that person, a staff member, deny that request and direct that uh, resident to go you know, to the uh, online or email or in-person application directly to our uh, city's clerk? I, I believe the answer to your question is yes. I believe the person at the center could say, I am not the custodian of records for the city. Um, you'll need to make your request to the clerk for the city because for precisely the same reasons you're saying, not only does the clerk have a responsibility for um, consistently providing documents and retaining documents according to a certain time frame, knowing where the documents are, how they're kept, um, that to me would be the best response, not for the person at the event hall to say, I'm denying your request, but to say, I'm not the custodian of documents for the city, and this is a city facility, and so all documents pertaining to this city will be held by the city clerk. All right, thank you. I just wanted to understand that part because I know that um, there are times that people will show up and request to look at documents. I wasn't sure um, if the proper um, response from our staff would have been that the request has to go directly to our records, um, public records custodian. But uh, thank you for the response. My pleasure. Virginia, did you want to add anything? I was just going to stop sharing this and pull up the other part of this statute um, and share my screen again so we can see that language, if that's if that would be helpful to see the part that a that a custodian can designate oh yes, someone I to think handle that would be request. helpful. Mm -hmm. So give me one second. I would also, while she's um, getting the screen share up, I would congratulate you again on the administrative policy and procedure that the city of Deltona has. Um, it's a nine page document. It's very well thought out. It cites the Sunshine Manual, which I think is great and sends people to um, sources to understand why the policy is the way it is. Um, I reviewed it I thought it was very, um, you know, that all of the things the attorney general recommends that a city or a municipality do, I think you have dotted your I's and crossed your T's on your policy. Okay, so I, I understand, um, you know, the uh, Virginia is looking for Here it the, is. the verbiage yeah. of assigning mm -hmm. a second person, but that's not what my question was referring to because there is a second person already in place. I'm referring to if somebody goes from department to department requesting copies of public records, um, is it the right um, answer for the person in those departments to send that person um, directly to our city clerk or the person assigned by the city clerk? Yes, because your clerk is the custodian of public records. Thank you, I just and wanted to hear from you. And the person who's going from office to office asking for the public records isn't asking the custodian. Thank you, I appreciate your answer. The other, the other important thing is um, that a request doesn't, doesn't have to be made in writing. It can be made orally, but um, you know, by email, by um, some some cities, I don't know if you do too, has a place on their website where you can type in your request right there on the website. Um, that is always the preferred way. Um, so 
you can even suggest, you know, you don't have to put it in writing for me, but it would make my job a lot easier and probably less costly for you if you could make a specific request. Um, just a thought. Okay, so I just have um, two, one, two questions for you, or one is a comment. So for example, I'm gonna read to you um, a public records request that was sent in uh, earlier this year, and it was for, from an email that address that would not indicate anyone's name. It's a random email at a Gmail address. And it says, public records request. For all records related to me, my emails, my address, or in any mm -hmm. other way related to me, Responsive yeah. records may include, but not necessarily limited to any and all communication in any and all forms, formats, mediums, and on and on and on. So when you have, and it's, and, and then the records are for the past 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, includes forum discussions in any group, uh, and, and so on and so forth, and it's then proceeds to ask, where are my other outstanding records that you haven't fulfilled? So for example, when you get that type of an, of a public records request, there are no records because you don't know who this person is. They've not provided you with a name, an address, a legitimate email address that says John Doe at gmail.com that you can even say, okay, hi, John Doe, right? So right. when you send back, you know, the first is your acknowledgement. We've received, an, you know, an automatic acknowledgement. We've received your public records request. And then you say there is no record. And then the, it continues. You're violating my rights. You're doing this. You're doing that. And it carries on and on and on. And, and this is a type of thing that we've been subjected to over time. And like I said, multiple different email addresses and multiple different requests. And you can read by the last paragraph, where are my other outstanding records responsive to my other requests, including but not limited to, do? and then there's a list. So then to the vice mayor's point, I mean, I agree with you, you have to each an answer each one individually, but realistically you're seeing by, by looking at all these that are coming in from other email addresses. So when the appropriate answer is no such record exists and, and the emails continue, and then you have to, you, your procedure has to be the same, is just what I'm asking you. You acknowledge and then you say no records exist. And, and then it becomes a threat of lawsuits and everything else. So would it be possible, and I'm just brainstorming with you here, this isn't part of my PowerPoint training, but just would it be possible to respond back to this person and say, You've asked for records about yourself, your address. You have every right to remain anonymous, but that gives us no information to go on. It gives us no way to look up the documents you've asked for. If you decide to give us your real name, your real address, then we would be happy to locate documents for you. But from what you've given us, you have chosen to stay anonymous and we can't possibly produce something from nothing. I mean, is that a possible response to this? Um, to, to call them out and say, look, you have every right to be anonymous, but if that's what you're gonna be, we can't possibly, physically, even if we wanted to, and we do, we couldn't possibly answer this request. I mean, I, I, that would be a question for legal in the clerk's office. I mean, I, I mean, it's just, that that's just one example of, of, of things that, that we receive. So I'm sure something like that is possible. Um, it, it's, probably at some point would result in the tirade of other emails that, of incompetency and you don't know who I am and so forth, but that's that's not following the policy. Um, so it might though, and I would leave this to your city attorney for sure, um, but it might, if this person ever did decide to sue the city, put you in a better place to say this, was harassment, this was frivolous, this this was not um, a legitimate
legitimate public records request. We tried our best to help this person, but they gave us no other option. So in that case, you very well might get attorney's fees for the city. Um, of course, I'm not a judge. Of course, I wouldn't know all the facts presented, but you know, just treating this person like a person and saying, look, we'd love to help you, but you're giving us nothing here. Agree. Definitely. And the, la the other question I have, um, a while ago, a few years ago, you had, um, there were multiple lawsuits against municipalities from people going to, like, for example, like, like our center and saying, I want to see the invoice for last night's comedy club and how many, you know, how many people showed up and what you made and, and, and I want to see the receipts. And the person behind there says, well, you know, what is your name? Well, I'm not going to give you my name. Well, why do you want to see these receipts? All, all those are violations of, of the public records law. And at that point, there were a lot of lawsuits that came from that. So I guess my point is to not, um, to not even, because it, like any municipality, you have a constant turnover of employees. You may have volunteers there. You may have kids, kids in park and rec that are interning and don't know that process, even though, you know, you try to instill that. So I think a, having a process for all of your staff to say, is this a public records, if this is a public records request, you, we go through the custodian of records, and here's a way to do that. Am, am I right? And that's what the answer should be? Yes, and because you do have employee, employees who turn over and students that may be helping out, maybe you even make a little placard for the desk that says, I am not the custodian of records. If you're here seeking records, please contact the city clerk's office. And I don't know. No, I mean, because I remember that was, a, that was a big issue a, a while ago for especially a lot of small municipalities had to expend a ton of money in, in attorney's fees for that. And, oh, and that's sad. It was, was terrible. Um, the last last question I have for you, and I and I maybe you've already explained it. When we talk about who can request a public record, and we just talked to um, what what several commissioners have talked to up here, when you request a deposit, and, and I I might have misunderstood this. So if someone makes a public records request, and then you tell them, okay, the, it, here's your estimate, and it's going to cost. Let's go with twenty five dollars again and then they pay the $25 and then you produce the record and, and then you say, okay, it's all ready for you to pick up. And you say, they say, nope, not, not gonna do it. Or um, what, what, are, what were your options? I mean, I know you can withhold the, the $25, but did you not say there was another way, like for example, if you say, well, I'm gonna give you an estimate for this entire thing and it's gonna cost $100. And and they yes. and they go you go through your clerk's department goes through and researches and researches all these pulls all the emails with a certain name and, and so forth, and you say okay this is going to cost fifty dollars and the person says yeah okay no I don't I don't want it and then they do it again and again and again did you say there was a, a way to to d address that yes this would this would be a, a possibility another option. Um, when we were working with the nonprofit and the executive agency of the governor's office, it wasn't the governor's office, executive office, it was an agency within the executive. When they got the records request, they looked at it, they did an estimate of what it was going to take, and they came up with a total of $42,000 and they sent it to this nonprofit. Well, the nonprofit immediately contacted us and said, we can't possibly pay $42,000. What's going on? This can't be right. And so we helped them write a nice email back and say, we can't possibly afford $42,000. Can we revise and narrow our request? And ultimately what happened was we helped them find the right person in the agency um, and got on the telephone with her and just talked about what they really wanted, what they were really looking for. And it was a nice conversation. So, but I will tell you, the agency was not going to release any records. The agency wasn't going to lift finger one until they received full payment for those records.
which now we've talked down to about $1,700. Um, and, and they could pay that and they paid that and then they got their records. So that is a possibility is that you send an invoice and on the invoice, you say, if you have any questions about this amount, and, and maybe it says, this is a bill we expect to be paid before we can start pulling your records. But you say, if you have any questions or can't afford to pay this, please call us. And then, you know, maybe your clerk, deputy clerk, people in their office can say, look, this is enormous. You've asked for emails going back five years. Do you really want five years worth or do you want five years worth for one person or five years worth on the subject of, I don't know, hula hoops? Um, you know, like teach them, te have the clerks help the requesters narrow the search in order to bring the cost down, because I think that will accrue to the benefit of everyone. Um, it won't end up costing all the redaction, all the copying, um, but it does rely on rational citizens behaving like community, you know, um, colleagues, it, it requires sort of a rational response is what I'm saying. Um, but yes, you could ask for a deposit of the full amount before you give any documents out. Yes, and I would like to say, I know I said I've heard of an agency that does checks. I think what Pam said, that would completely undermine the anonymity of the public records law and how you can request records anonymously. So I think it is important to have an option that is just cash, but it is okay to request the cat all of the cash payment in advance. That is not um, undermining and in violation of the records law. And it's in the of the attorney general and courts have said you can require before an agency does any work to redact information, they can require the cost up front. So I would not, I take that back about just limiting to certain payments. I think it's probably good to have different options and have cash an option, but just having that full cash payment in advance before going through the process of converting records and producing the records. Okay. Thank you. But I and, and I just what we said at the beginning that it's it's very much not an easy answer and it's a very complicated area. Um, when you make your estimate, if the estimate is over the actual cost, you're going to have to refund somehow, some way <laughs> to your anonymous source. So, um, and, and that's because it's not, this law was not created to make a profit, but to allow access to documents. So it's not easy. I empathize with you. Well, <laughs> my heart is full. <laughs> and I just wanna be clear that, that my, my questions on this are not to charge the public for public records. Right. What, what we have experienced in the past is an inundation of public records that has pretty much paralyzed the clerk's office and actually caused us to have to hire two more people in that office because of public records. And so um, just, just having some of those clear guidelines publicly stated doesn't mean that that's what you're gonna do and that we're not looking to charge members of the public for something that's rightfully theirs to acquire. But Absolutely. when it becomes a situation where you cripple the function, the daily function of your, your public records custodian, then it, it, it becomes necessary to look at what options you have, in my opinion, and I think you provided those. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Well, I, the, the other the other option that you do have is with respect to the extensive use fee and when that kicks in. Um, your policy kicks in at 15 minutes. You can decide 
that you wanted to have a policy that kicks in at 30 minutes or an hour or two hours. Um, but I think that's going to depend on the FTE you have <laughs> and, you know, um, how much time it's taking them, the actual cost, their salary, their benefits, everything that it takes to have them on board for that time to do that work. So, that, I mean, that is an option to consider. I, I hear you wanting to be open, provide access, um, and that's another thing to think about is, is maybe stretching out that time that you give to the public before the excessive fee kicks in. Okay, thank you. I just have um, Commissioner McCool, and then um, we'll start wrapping up. Yeah, real quick. Um, I wanted to ask that now we have had this workshop and asked that if we have residents um, and keeping in mind your mission statement, if we have residents that need that help that they feel that they must have outside of what the clerk can offer, okay, may we give you as a referral to our residents that might feel a little more secure dealing with you as opposed to our clerk. Because I will tell you this, um, as you know, working with a municipality and working with residents, um, that we have um, we have had situations where we have had people stated that they they do these to shut down the government, and I thought that that was like a unicorn until I became a commissioner and saw the volume of records. And I I'm pretty sure that from one person there are about six banker boxes. Oh. Of, of request, am I, I'm not over exaggerating, am I? About six banker boxes, and think about this, in each banker box, 2,500 pages will go into one banker box front and back. That's 5,000 pages in one banker box of request from someone whose pointed mission is to shut down the government. So with that being said, there's sometimes adversarial relationship between resident and clerk trying to get, and, and, and my point is for my residents, my constituents, I have a duty to uphold and make sure that they get what they want. And with that being said, I want to make sure that they have a source to go to if they don't feel confident. So I'm asking you, may we give you as a resource for our residents to contact with help perhaps whittling down a public records request, navigating through the process and understanding kind of both sides of the coin, how we have to work symbiotically to get them, may we give you as a resource? Absolutely, yes. That is what we're here for. We are here to answer citizens, journalists, teachers, officials, um, that's what we're here to do. Um, so yes, and now the city of Deltona is a member and um, we'd be willing to help you however we can. I can keep it in mind that we're a, a small nonprofit with only three, three employees. <laughs> I can share our screen with our contact information if you would like it. Would that be good? Okay. Thank you too very much for providing timely information. Um, so thank you on behalf of uh, my residents. It's been our pleasure. I'm, I'm so glad you reached out to us and that we've been able to um, hopefully help you sleep better at night. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to uh, Mr. Peters and Marsha and the clerk's office for um, working together to bring this presentation. We don't have anyone that signed up for public comment. Um, so what we'll do is go to city manager. Do you have any comments? No comments. Okay, uh, one more a commission, one more comment before I adjourn July 19th. That is one week from today. My sticky note, commission photos, apologies to, I know. You're not gonna be here, right? Okay, um, if we wanna redo those, let us know in an email, Commissioner King will not be here the 19th. So if we wanna change the date, let yeah. us send out an email so that Commissioner King can be here. Otherwise, he, there's always Photoshop, which 
you know, we don't want to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. Thank you.